and there was them. And we don't believe, a Jew can be a lot of things. A Jew can even be an agnostic or an atheist. But Jesus, out the question. That's the way I grew up. And I wasn't taught to hate anybody. I was not taught to disrespect anybody. But there's us and there's them, uh, 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 the Christians. Now, I was taught that they, many of them very nice people, but every 50 or 60 years they start killing us. We don't know what's up with that, but uh, we go in and out of vogue, you know? We go in and out of vogue sometimes. And those crusades didn't help none, you know, the crusades. And that's why, you know, if I ever get a chance to talk to Billy Graham, God bless him, I want to say, did, did you have to call him the Billy Graham crusades? I mean, was that necessary? Was that necessary? <clears throat> but anyway, um, I am a man with a plan, a soul with a goal, and a Jew with a view. <clears throat> and when I was a kid, I, um, even though there was us and there was them, I was kind of haunted by every uh, Christmas. There, everybody's singing, joy to the world, the Lord is come. Joy to the world. Now, as a believer, uh, I don't know what you're in the kingdom of God for. I'm in it for the joy. That's what I'm in it for. And, uh, and people say, oh, you're joy. You're in it for the joy. Well, in Sunday school, don't they sing, we got the joy, 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 joy down in my heart. Where? See, people forget where it is. You know, I got the joy, 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 joy down in my heart. Where? Down in my heart. Where? Down in my heart, I got the joy, 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 joy. Down in my, where? They keep forgetting where it is. You know, because we get the bamboozled by the external. See, kingdom of God is within, within, within. And so, even though Jesus was not on the menu, it turns out, guess what? Christianity is fraught with Judaism. There's a connection. It's foundational. You see, for example, the Blessed Virgin Mary was a Jewish mama. Go figure. She was a Jewish mama. Now, a lot of people, they made her into a Catholic nun or something like that. The Blessed Virgin Mary. She was a Jewish mama, and she was just like all Jewish mamas. She said, my son, he walks on water for the goyim, but does he come by and visit me? <laughs> you know. So it took me a long time to realize that he is the promised Messiah, the Jewish Messiah and the Messiah of all. See, but I, I, I was thrown off by the religiosity. I wasn't into no religiosity, you see. And you know what threw me off was the sermonettes. When I was a kid, 2 o'clock in the morning, when the good stuff was getting ready to go off the air, back then, in order for a TV station to keep its license, they had to have a certain amount of what they call religious programming. Religious programming. And they didn't care what it was. They wanted to keep the license from the FCC. So they would bring a Christian out. They'd bring a guy out, preferably with a collar. They liked them better than just some guy wearing a shirt, you know. And they'd bring him out, and, uh, you know, it was kind of like, do, 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 do. See, before that, they had all the singing and dancing and the Carson show, Tonight Show. Hey, we're running late, so don't forget to go see Zsa Zsa at the Persian Room. We love you. Good night, everybody. Then they bring the sermonette out, see. And the guy says, boo do 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 And that's the signal for all the people that it's time to go to sleep. Time to go to sleep. So when you're ready to go to sleep or die, that's when they bring the Christians out. It, it was like that when I was a kid. That's what I thought. I thought it was like, and it took me a while to find out he's the life. He's the power. He's the... He's the joy. He, it says in his presence is fullness of joy. You know, so it was kind of a bit of a thing for me. 
And when I came to faith, <coughs> when I came to faith, I was in my 30s. Because, you know, here's a, here's a truth for you. You can write this one down. He brings you to what it is by the default of what it ain't. He brings us to what it is by the default of what it ain't. And so you've got to go through a certain amount of what it ain't to be tenderized and ready and receptive to what it is. See? So that's normal. That's life. That's the way life works. Because here's a profound truth. Life, you get born, life is a God school. It's the God school. People think, you just get born. What school are you talking about? Getting born, we get born into the God school. Whether you like it or not, whether you believe in God or not, we are in the God school. And we go through things. You're supposed to learn from things. And you're supposed to, to catch things. Because some things can't be taught. They can only be caught. You know? But when I came to faith, people always ask me, they ask a Jewish guy all the time, what did your mama say? What did your grandma say? What did your relatives say? They threw you out the house, didn't they? The Christians like to hear a lot of getting thrown out of the house stories when you give your testimony. No, they like that. You know, if you didn't get thrown out of the house, what kind of, uh, what kind of testimony is that? They want to hear, you know. As a matter of fact, When um, you're asked to give your testimony somewhere, when you come to faith, uh, they, like, they like Jewish testimonies because they like something that's unusual. If somebody ran forward and accepted the Lord when they were six years old, they go, okay, baby, sit down there and eat, eat, eat the chicken. You know, we, we, want, we want some hell's angel or we want some uh, Meshuggah Jewish guy, you know, kind of thing. And, uh, I, you know, I, I began getting invited to give my testimony places, you know, how I came to faith in Yeshua HaMashiach, Jesus Christ. And so, but at these dinners that they have, they had a thing called Full Gospel Businessmen's Dinners back then. Remember those? And, um, you know, people would give their testimony. So they asked me to give my testimony. <clears throat> and, they, and they'd introduce me. And they'd go, all right, here's a, here's, here's a man, <coughs> Rosenberg. And uh, he, uh, he's, 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 he's a Jewish man, and he's going to give his testimony. But see, these places where they give their testimonies, uh, it's kind of like it's kind of like the world's heavyweight championship most degraded testimony competitions. You know, they want the ones that had a degraded life before they came to faith, see. And so there was a guy, you know, before me, he would come out, I was the sinner of all sinners. I used to be drunk every day by noon. Next guy comes out and says, you waited till noon? Why'd you wait till noon? You didn't have to wait till noon. Hey, I, I was drunk before I got out of bed in the morning. Next speaker comes out, you had a bed? You had a bed. You wanna come in here with a testimony you, you had a bed? You know what my bed was? My bed was the sidewalk. That was my bed. The asphalt, concrete. And now here he is, Bert Rosenberg. Oh, my goodness. I, can, I don't think I can compete with all of that, but it's not a competition. You know, you just tell the truth. You know, you should know the truth. The truth will set you free. You know, so, you know, but, you know, they want to hear that, that Jewish thing, you know. So, shalom. Shalom. Uh, and, you know, and I would tell, tell the saga. I'll tell you one thing. If a Jewish person comes to the Lord, it wasn't because they happened to be in the neighborhood. Something happened to that guy or that woman. They, they, they hit the wall hard somewhere along the line. You know, but that's not a bad thing. Not a bad thing. But you don't want to coast along on the low level. You want to you hit, hit the high. You want to hit the high. And he is the highest. <clears throat> so... <clears throat> I um, was a new believer. I didn't know anything about ministry. <clears throat> I didn't know what a ministry was. But I would see these guys. They would come to this fellowship that I was going to. And whenever any minister would come to the, to the church, to the fellowship, they all looked the same. They sent advance promo out. And whenever they sent advance promo out, 
The picture of the guy of might and power always looked the same. Looked like this. Always looked like that all the time. And then they showed the people, you know, and the people were always, you know, and I thought, oh, okay, all right, all right. It takes a while to figure out that it's not trying to imitate and impersonate somebody that's impersonating another minister. Because there's so many ministers that are impersonating each other. You, 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 you have to dare to be something ain't nobody ever seen before. Because you're the only one of you that they got. Period. It takes a while to dare to be something ain't nobody ever seen before. And that's a good thing. And it ain't a bad thing when somebody looks at you and they go, what? Not a bad thing. Not a bad thing. What? That's not bad. Because you, that, that, there has never been you at, at, at no time. So <clears throat> I'd look in scripture. There were some scriptures that actually haunted me. One of them was, how about this one? Delight yourself in the Lord. He will grant you the desires of your heart. I thought, really? I thought you were supposed to, you, you're supposed to go and do something you don't want to do. It just will grant you the desires of your heart. But then you got to look at what is the desire of your heart. Not the whim of the moment, but what is the deep desire of your, of your deep heart? And I thought, what, what do I want to do? What do I want to be? If anything was possible, because it says with God all things are possible, and I believed it. I said, what would I like to do? Mm. You know what I'd like to do? I'd like to travel around and have some laughs in the name of the Lord. And God said, okay, all right, good, do that. And I thought, okay, that's okay. And I mean, travel around, have some laughs in the name of the Lord with, uh, with God's people and people who are not yet God's people. And uh, because it says make a joyful noise, well, if laughs, laughing is not a joyful noise, pray tell, what is it? It's a joyful noise. <clears throat> and it says in his presence is fullness of joy. But see, it takes a while to know where his presence is because it's always somewhere other than where you are. Back early on before you know that wherever you are, that's where he is because he indwells you once you surrender to him. Wherever you are, he is because he indwells you and that way you don't have to worry about getting closer to Jesus. Make me closer. You're as close as you're ever going to get once you open your heart. And you go, well, don't feel like that. Yeah, so, but he's there. <clears throat> he's there. Kingdom of God is within you. Kingdom of God is within you. Kingdom of God is within you. So, <clears throat> I said, I want to travel around, have some laughs with God's people. <clears throat> and I didn't know any better. That's a good way to approach things, by the way. Don't know any better. Because you get too smart with this stuff. You get too theological. And, you know, you, you, you diminish yourself. With God, anything is possible. Anything is possible. I want to have some laughs. So then, they send around a little promo. Here's Bert Rosenberg and be some laughs and blah, blah, blah. So what they think is going to be some jokes, right? It's going to be some jokes. Well, I don't necessarily do jokes per se, because jokes, think about it. Jokes are things that are prevarications because they didn't happen. The, uh, the, the, the priest and the rabbi and, and, and the minister uh, didn't all go in the bar, you know. Uh, uh, didn't, I mean, you know, maybe it did, but I don't know. I don't think they have pictures. But I mean, they, they, people tell these things. And here's the thing about jokes. It's kind of controversial about jokes among believers because the nature of a joke is, by its nature, it makes fun of something or somebody. And all of these somebody's got attorneys now. <laughs> got attorneys. They got anti-defamation operations going on. 
You can't make fun of anybody. And then, you know, people say, well, we mustn't uh, uh, deride people and uh, mock, we, you know, mock people. And, peop you know, and how do you know if a joke is edifying? And, you know, all these jokes go around on the Internet, and people don't know whether to send them on or not. But they do. But they, you know, at least, you know. But a believer, you're going to send some jokes that uh, make fun of people? You know. So I decided, you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to write a book. I'm going to write a book. I'm working on a book. Name of the book is Jokes That Must Not Be Told by Christians for Your Own Protection. But if you tell one, you could get forgiven. That's the name of the book. And that way, if you hear a joke, you go and use it as a reference manual. You look in there and you see if the joke is in there. And if it's in there, don't tell it. Don't tell it because it's been passed upon by the deacon board of joke jokery that you, you shouldn't tell these because it makes fun of somebody and somebody's going to get a wrong idea and they're going to get offended. And heaven forbid, somebody uh, could get offended. And there's some people... They walk around offended. They want to be offended. They like being offended, you know? It gives them a purpose in life, you know? And so it's heavy. So in this book is all the jokes that must not be told. You want to hear one? You want to hear one? This is for research purposes. These are not to leave this room because... Uh, the name of the book is Jokes That Must Not Be Told, But If You Tell One, You Can Get Forgiven. You know what I mean? <laughs> For example, you remember when we were kids, they had the Little Rascals, Little Rascals movies, you know, and they had all these kids, and they had little buckwheat, right? Buckwheat. And of course, these kids grew up, everybody loved buckwheat, <clears throat> you know. And some, some people thought it was stereotypical, and some people said, no, it's just a, you know, it's a kid, and, uh, you know. Buckwheat uh, grew up eventually, and he passed away, but about a year before he passed away, he became a Muslim. And he changed his name to Kareem Awit. <laughs> Kareem Awit! Do not tell that one. I, I'm, you've, been, you've been warned. You've been warned. Don't tell it. You get blowed up if you tell that one. You get blowed up. I mean, you can't be telling that. <laughs> Want to hear another one for research? This is for research. Do not tell, do not tell this one. There was this cowboy, see, and this was back in the Old West, around old Dodge City, you know, way back. This cowboy was out on the prairie by himself for six months. Nobody around but him. And after six months, he comes into the town, old Dodge City, and he goes into the what? The saloon. <coughs> He goes into the saloon, because that was kind of the focal point of a lot of activity among men back then. And he walks in, he says uh, to the bartender, he says, um, what do you all do here for fun in this town? He said, well, he said, you know, once per month, we have a, a dance. We have a dance once a month. He says, oh, really? He says, uh, when is the next one? He goes, well, actually, it's, it happens it's tonight. It's tonight? He goes, yeah. He says, well, where is it? I'm here in the, in the saloon. He said, oh, really? He said, what time is it? It's 8 o'clock. So he gets a room upstairs at the saloon in the hotel, <clears throat> gets all, you know, good, shaved, gets all cleaned up, puts on his, puts on his best, and uh, smells good and whatnot. And he comes down in there to the dance, and he looks around, and it's all men on one side of the room. And on the other side of the room, it's all cows. So he goes over to the bartender. He goes, what's up? It says men and cows in here. He goes, oh, 
I forgot to tell you, we don't have any women in this town. So we have a dance, and the men dance with the cows. Well, he goes, men dance with the cows. Okay, all right, well, you know. So he's standing there looking around. There's one particular cow seemed to uh, take a liking to him. And she's kind of looking at him, you know, at eye contact, you know what I'm saying? And uh, kind of blinking, you know. And uh, he figures, I don't know, I think I feel something. I, I, have, I have feelings here. I'm going to go ask her to dance. So he goes over. And he uh, asks her to dance. And she comes out on the floor with him. And all the men in the bar at the dance are backing up, backing up, backing up. And they're shaking and quaking. And then he and the cow are the only two on the floor. So he goes, what, what, what? And the bartender comes sneaking over. He says, OK, you're dancing with Black Bart's girl. Thank you. That's, that's, that was the punchline, by the way. You're dancing with Black Bart's girl. It was a cow. Would you explain? Would you explain? You can't. <laughs> you cannot tell that one. What's that? <laughs> yeah, that's what I'm saying. Don't tell it. Number one, you ain't going to get no laughs. And number two, you get on the wrong side of the Trans Species Guild, you know? <clears throat> so forget that one. That utterly horrible. Utterly horrible? Utter, utterly. That was some of that funny stuff, wasn't it? Mm, boing. <clears throat> anyway, <clears throat> so I began traveling around. I mean, I'm telling you, don't tell them jokes. Anyway, the real deal is not telling jokes. It's to be in the presence of the living God and in his presence is fullness of joy. And you can be in any situation, regardless of what it looks like outside, and inside, you're dancing. You know what I mean? You're dancing. You're, you're doing the, the hora, the freilach. You're, 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 you're dancing because in his presence is fullness of joy. But people don't know where his presence is. They're always going, well, I want to find God. Where is God? And they'll travel all over the place. You know, and anywhere you go, they have these um, movements and they have these an anointing. They had the... Uh, uh, what do they call it, the Toronto Blessing a few years ago. You, any of you all remember that, the Toronto Blessing? Where people were going up to Toronto because that's where God was moving. And then in uh, Oklahoma, in um, Broken Arrow, Oklahoma, they had um, the Rhema Bible Training School. And the Spirit of God would break loose. And I knew some people that went there. And they said, Bert, you got to come here, man. This is where God is moving. You want to just stay and play church somewhere, okay, but this is where God has moved. But the only problem is, everywhere you move, they go, mmm, you should have been here last week. He was moving, boy. <laughs> well, I'm here this week. Well, we don't know about this week, but last week, ooh, the anointing, the anointing was, was thick. It was, it, was, it, was, it was powerful. So, <clears throat> and a lot of people go to Israel. Because they figure that's where God lives, right? Lives in Israel. As a Jew, people always ask me, they say, have you been to Israel? Have you been to Israel? Yeah, I did. I went to Israel. 19, uh, it's been a while. 1995, went to Israel. Spent about, uh, uh, spent about mm, three weeks. Three weeks in Israel. Went to all the places, did all the things. You know, you want to walk where Jesus walked. Went to the garden tomb. At the garden tomb, you know, that's where they put Jesus in the tomb for three days. And they couldn't hold him. So they got the garden tomb, and they got the tomb there. And when you go, there's a sign, and it says, He is not here. He is risen. He's not here. 
I said, I came halfway across the world and he ain't here. <laughs> I'm looking for him. Where, you know, I'm looking for him. They say, well, he is risen. I go, oh, really? And then they have this place you may have heard of in Israel. It's called Ein Gedi. Ein Gedi. Uh, it's a little town, and it's the place where they found the Dead Sea Scrolls. The Dead Sea Scrolls. And uh, I went there, and uh, they were explaining. They go, okay, this, this um, a, a cave is where they found the Dead Sea Scrolls, but they're not here now. They're at the university being studied. I said, this is where they found them, but, but they ain't here? Could you show me somewhere where they got something that's there? Well, I went to the upper room, the upper room in Jerusalem, the upper room. <clears throat> and they had a, uh, a, a tour guide, and he's saying, and on this spot, they make it dramatic, you know what I mean? Make it dramatic. And on this spot, this is where Andrew, Jesus' brother, fell to his knees, and he cried out, oh, God. And I'm going, right there? Wow. Right, on, what, right there? And he goes, yes, this is the upper room, the famous upper room. And as we were coming down from there, uh, there was this, um, there was this um, church, this uh, Orthodox church, and it was, you know, you have to go way down, and there's an uh, Orthodox priest. He's out front. He goes, you... Uh, you were up in the, uh, what they call the upper room up there? I said, uh, yeah, yeah, just up, just there, just came down. He said, that, uh, that is not the upper room. I said, that's not the upper room? No, no. Where, where is it? He goes, we have it in here, in their church. I said, you have it in here? He said, yes. You want to see? I go, well, sure. The upper room, you know, that's where the, Men gathered, you know, after the crucifixion, and they're looking at each other like, what? What, do we, what, what, what are we going to do now? What? <clears throat> so he takes, takes us down some stairs. This is, all, this is true. Takes us down some stairs, and there's a picture of a lady in a little uh, frame, picture frame, and the priest says, this is a picture of the Virgin Mary painted from life by the Apostle Luke. I said, Luke painted her? He said, yes, from life. She, I said, she posed for him and he painted the picture? And he goes, yes. And I go, you would have, you would have thought we would have heard about that. He said, this is not a joke here. This is not a joke. This is the upper room. I said, the upper room is downstairs, but I, you, I would have thought it would have been up, upstairs, upper room. He goes, this is not a joke. This is not a joke. I said, I'm not making a joke. I, I, you know, if you are out going far and wide looking for Jesus, believe me, he'll find you if you're seeking. He will find you. But if you never get that inner connection where his spirit and your spirit are joined, and then you are frolicking in him, then you can run around this world looking for where he moved last week, and you're always disappointed. So the trick is, Galatians 2.20, you've been crucified, you're dead, but nevertheless you live. But it's no longer you that live, but it's he that liveth in you. And the life you now live, you live by the faith of the Son of God in you, living and moving, having his way with you, uniquely in you, from you, as you. As you. Now, some people choke on that as you part. You know. What do you mean as you? Well... He indwells you. He has created you to be something ain't nobody ever seen before. And it delights him when you dare to be that for which you are created. That is the joy. That is the joy right there. Find that thing. Know that thing. And if you don't know what it is, try things. And there'll be some things ah, 
that come through you that bring uh, that bring worship. We heard it with the worship team, right? Liberty University, a worship collective. Sound like communism to me. <laughs> no, I'm just messing with you. Um, beautiful, beautiful. You could see the devotion, you know, and some of them you could see are just, you know, in that, you know, and others are just diligently being about that for which they're created, you know, to, br and to bring worship unto God. Beautiful. Thank you. <coughs> Thank you. <coughs> so I began traveling all around, and I was going here and going there and this and that and speaking, and I didn't know anything about how to do a ministry. Uh, I only knew one thing about how I wanted to do a ministry. I ain't sending out mail begging people for money every five minutes. You know, I got tired of that. You send somebody a, send a ministry, anything. Next thing you know, you're on the list. Boom, 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 boom. You know, I said, I, there must be another way. How about if you just be what God has created you to be and trust God with skillful and godly wisdom and allow him to show you how to express him uniquely in you as you. And, and, and trust and not be afraid. You know, I used to travel around, you know, having laughs with God's people. But then God spoke to me. He said, okay, we're not just about laughs, laughs, laughs. We're about insight. We're about revelation, revealing, you know. I said, well, I'm not a theologian. I'm not a... And he goes, no, no, but laughs is great but you need to go a little deeper. So I began doing these, what I call joy seminars. Joy seminars. And I travel around the country doing those, been doing it for years. Traveling everywhere, been everywhere. Everywhere you could think of, been there. Been in every state in the union, including Hawaii and Alaska, except for two, only two. And I would like to go to those two, but somebody's got to invite me, you know what I mean? Because I learned if you jump up on the platform at a church and they didn't invite you uh, it could get it could get serious you might you might meet some police officers to, that you could witness to you know what I mean anyway <clears throat> North Dakota and South Dakota haven't been there okay but anyway I travel around doing these joy seminars they are typically two days or three days <clears throat> and um, you know, if you have a seminar, uh, unless you have PowerPoint, they don't believe it's really a ministry. Right? So I said, all right, I'll get some PowerPoint. And so here's my PowerPoint. I'm going to show you a few things. Now, I don't have time uh, to do the whole thing because, it, you know, it lasts two, three days. We could, do, we could do it at one. We could do one at your church if you were so inclined. Go to joyseminars.com joyseminars.com or my email which is bertrose at aol.com I'm the last guy in AOL holding down the fort <laughs> last guy standing because I've, I've, I've been I had that address for so long people know my address I just keep it I got a, I got a gmail and I got a this and a that don't you know <clears throat> but bertrose at aol.com or joyseminars at AOL.com. Anyway, let me, I'm going to give you a little dollop. Comprende dollop. A little, a little taste, a little nosh, a little taste of my joy seminar. I can't do it all, but I'm just going to trip the light fantastic. First of all, on this first picture, you know, I like colors. God likes colors, you know. You know, you can look at that and you go, well, look at this. nobody wears them colors. What are you, Fagala? What, 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 what? Fagala, that means a um, person of, a, a flamboyant. We'll go with that. <clears throat> In pure light, he is the light, is he not? He is the light of the world. And in him, we are the light of the world. And you know, a pure beam of light 
Do you know how many colors are contained within that light? Every blessed color that exists. Every single one. Now you get a, you know, some kind of prism or something, and wow, you see all these colors. You know, that was it. They're in the light. But you, it, you, it, it, something has to happen for you to, to see them. And that's us. That's us. We're his light bearers. If we dare. Now here's the good news. You don't have to be some flamboyant schmendrick. That means a schmo. That means a jerk. That doing all kind of crazy stuff that you're not called to do. You don't have to do that. You don't have to be obnoxious. You don't have to uh, be the oddest person in the room. Not required. You're welcome. You know, somebody could say, why don't you put a big picture of yourself up there? You know, I don't have any problem with that because I'm dead. But nevertheless, I live. But it's no longer me that live, but it's him. And you know what scripture says? When a man or a woman is dead, he is free. When a man's dead, he is free. Now, I'm not talking about when your body falls on the ground. I'm talking about when you die to a false notion of who you are, and you come into your true self, which is your spirit and God's spirit, joined, living, moving, and having your being in him and his being in you, and you're loving one another, loving him and loving one another. That's all you need to know, by the way. We've had all these speakers, you know, all you need. And they were great. I love them. Thank you, each of you. But I'll tell you this. All you need to know, love him, love them. Love him, love them. I got it down to four words. Love him, love them. But I found out as a speaker, when you get your message down to four words, they don't invite you back after that. They don't invite you back. So I said, okay, well, I'll have a seminar. Seminar. So let me give you a little taste. We got the uh, stuff. I got a clicker. I hope this works. And I'm going to run past some of them because we don't have time to do them all. But um, joy, it's all about joy. Where is the joy? How do we apprehend the joy? How do we experience it? You know, instead of talking about it and just throwing scriptures at each other. We have to know that it's the will of God for us to have joy. Here's Oswald Chambers. He discovered the secret of a successful ministry. Be dead so that people don't think you're, 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 you're trying to sell uh, t-shirts and whatnot. We carry our religion as if it were a headache. There is neither joy nor power nor inspiration in it. None of the grandeur of the unsearchable riches of the Messiah about it. None of the passion of hilarious confidence in God. How's the wall chambers? That's a good one. Hilarious confidence in God. I like that. We have to know we have permission. Permission. And it's not just one obscure scripture in there. It's all permeated throughout Scripture. Jump for joy. Now, you heard jump for joy, that saying, jump for joy. Did you know it was a Scripture? It's actually a Scripture, jump for joy. You're not going to go charismaniac on us, are you? I'm just telling you what it says in the, in, the, in the Word. Jump for joy, Luke 6, 23. This is a good one. He who has a glad heart has a continual feast. Here's the key to the whole seminar. If you want to have joy, be a joy bringer. If you want to have joy, be a joy bringer. There's no other way. He is the way, and in him, the way to have joy is be a joy bringer. Extracting, trying to get somebody to do you, help you, give you, do you, do you, do you. These human beings, God bless them, they're highly unreliable for joy purposes. They might have a little a strong uh, quasi, quote unquote, anointing on the front end, but apart from him, you got bupkis. That's a Yiddish word, means nothing. You got nothing, bupkis. You got nada, zippo. So there's all these scriptures. I'm not going to read every one of them. 
The joy of the Lord is your strength. Your sorrow will be turned into joy. The fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace. And people say, yeah, but what about that long suffering? Yeah, you don't mention that in your seminar. About the long suffering, how about that? Yeah, what about it? Well, how come you don't mention it? All right, I mention it, you know. Have, 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 have you missed any of that? Nobody's missed it. We've experienced it. Long suffering. Okay. But I'm talking about how to, I, I look at long suffering as mm, fertilizer. Fertilizer. Yeah, fertilizer. Which, um, there's other terms for that. And, you know, the seed comes up through that. And if he doesn't know what's beyond that, he could be tempted to think life is a bunch of mm, fertilizer. But your sorrow will be turned into joy. And we sing, you will go out with joy and be led forth in peace. Right? So I'm just telling you, Joy is the will of God. It's not a default position, and it's not if, if plan A doesn't work, joy is plan B. You know what I'm so you have to understand it's his will. Well, how come there's not more joyful Christians? What are you asking me? I'm talking to you. What, are you going to get all them people straightened out? You don't need to get everybody straightened out. I'm talking to you. Okay. Oh, oh this is good. Look at this. This is a hymn written at the top there by Christopher Wordsworth. Now, you know, his brother was famous, William Wordsworth. He was a poet, William Wordsworth. You heard of him? He got famous being a poet. And this was his less known hymn writing brother. And here's one, O oh, Day of Rest and Gladness. Gladness. Hmm. That's good. First line. O oh, day of rest and gladness. O oh, day of joy and light. And I was able to find a picture of William Wordsworth. And I saw that. I go, what? Now, a couple of points about that. Do you know that you can be sad and still have joy? Do you know that you can look sad and have joy on the inside? Because he looks on the inner man. So we don't go by that. Now at one time I looked at that and I go, where's the, jo where's the joy? And uh, Maybe he was writing to give himself hope. Could be, who knows. But in any case, joy. Um, and he wrote, O day of joy and gladness. And sometimes we're tempted to go look over yonder by and by some day on that day over Jordan we're going to have some joy. I'm here to suggest the revelation that joy is here and now and it has to be apprehended. That's what I believe it means when it says the kingdom of God is taken by violence. You ever seen that one? That one threw me because I didn't know what, what? I, I, don't, I don't get it. But what it is is when you have a reality that the Lord reveals to you, take it. Take it. Don't diddly daddly around and ask eight dozen uh, theologians about it. They never agree on nothing. You theologians. <clears throat> now, we're heading toward the end, but I want to. Uh, how much time I got left? Ten minutes? Okay, I, I heard a voice that said ten minutes. An angel. An angel spoke to me from back there. <clears throat> When Yeshua, 
which is Hebrew for Jesus, was walking around. He spoke in parables. Parables are things that compare something because the, the thing you're trying to reveal is too ephemeral or it's invisible or it's difficult to apprehend. So Jesus used to speak in parables. And he would say things like, mm, the kingdom of God is like a mustard seed. It's very small. But when it grows, it's huge. The kingdom of God is like a mustard seed. And people go, oh, okay, all right. Or he says, the kingdom of God is like a field. And it's so valuable that a man gave up everything for this field. And people go, oh, okay, okay. He was trying to explain the kingdom, the unseen realm, because you can be fooled by the external sagas and dramas out here. You know, you get fooled by it because it seems real. And I'm not saying it doesn't exist, but you know what it is? The partial masquerading as the whole. The partial masquerading as the whole. And Jesus would speak in parables because he wanted to reveal the unseen to the finite human knucklehead. You know? No disrespect to anybody here. Because apart from him, we're a, we're, 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 we're a sad bunch of beings, I must say. Now, I got a parable for you. Here's the interesting thing. The parables were not just the ones he said, because if you know how to see, every physical thing will reveal the unseen reality. Everything. If you know how to see, a, um, a caterpillar becomes a butterfly when it goes into the cocoon, right? And in the cocoon... It's a dark night. And the caterpillar wonders, where did he go wrong? Turns out that is the necessary precondition to become this new creation. That's a parable, ain't it? Well, I got a, I got a, I got a fresh parable for you. The kingdom of God is like a helium balloon. A helium balloon. And, ooh, we have one here. What are the odds? A helium balloon. Now what makes a helium balloon be a helium balloon? It's not the mylar or the plastic. It's the infilling. It's the infilling. Now, the infilling, apart from the container, would be invisible. Nobody would notice it. It would be diffused. But when it's contained within a visible container, it's the infilling. And you, what do you have to do to get a helium balloon to go up? Let go of what's holding it down. Let go of what's holding it down. You don't have to beg it to go up. You don't have to pray for it to go up. You, you let go of what's holding it down, and it goes up. That's what it does. That's its nature. That is us. We are his helium balloons. We might have a different appearance on the outside, but it's the infilling that gives it its ascendancy. That gives it its ascendancy. He is risen. Hallelujah. He is risen. Hallelujah. He is risen. He is risen in us. It's a parable. That's us. 
But you've got to let go of what's holding it down. Now, what's holding it down? Every human being in this room, in one way or another, is hanging on to what I call a joy killer. A joy killer. And I have a list of 14. I can't go over the whole 14 now. Don't have time. But uh, hopefully, I can do a joy seminar round and uh, would love to go into the, the fullness of it. <clears throat> 14 joy killers, identifying things that make you miserable, whether you know it or not. I'll tell you what's the worst kind of joy killer. One that we hang on to with a death grip in the name of the Lord. We think the Lord requires us to do some kind of thing that makes us uh, cramped. You know, what, you know what happens when you hold on to a hand full of sand? You end up with an empty hand and a cramp. An empty hand and a cramp. And that's the condition of a lot of folks. Empty and, cr and cramped or cramped, you know? Let me give you a couple of joy killers. And then uh, we must... We must depart. Joy killer number one. Taking your identity from your body. Your identity. I'm not saying you don't have a body. I'm not talking about out-of-body experiences. Taking your identity from it. See, I'm talking about identity. Who are you? Who are you? And most people, you tell them, how are you? They tell you how their body's doing, right? How are you? Well, I had a little cram here, and I had a thing, and I spent uh, two days in bed, and uh, this and that. Oh, well, that's your body, right? Yeah. Uh -huh. But how are you doing? How are you doing? Me? What do you mean? You, your inner being. Inner being? No. Every joy killer has an antidote in the Lord. Isn't that something? Every antidote, I mean every joy killer, has an antidote in the Lord. Taking your identity from your body, you know what the antidote is? Come to your true identity. Your spirit, his spirit, join one spirit living in and through you. And when you get used to that, mm, your life is a continual feast. Instead of one problem after another, different day, same stuff. Get rid of that. Let go of that. You know, different day, same stuff. Whoop. Let go of that one. I mean, let's do one more, and then we'll have to come to a close. Oh, this is big. Mm. Leaving some other person can make you happy. We've all fallen for that one. We think, hmm, you meet somebody. Like that cowboy with the cow. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I shouldn't let that one be. I couldn't help it. I couldn't help it. <clears throat> he thought the cow was going to make him happy. Still not funny. <laughs> well, what are you going to do? Can I get forgiven for that? Yeah. <clears throat> I thought I'd give it one more, one more reference. You meet somebody, that magic thing happens. Mm -hmm. You feel like, ooh, we got that thing, that affinity, that thing. And then, you know, it affects your neurotransmitter pathways. They start singing. Mm -hmm. You know, brain chemistry. See, most relationships, most relationships are conceived on drugs. I'm talking about brain chemistry. I'm talking about endorphins and pheromones and oxytocin, and all of that, you feel, you feel that thing, it's irresistible. You meet somebody, ooh, and then you start running towards each other in slow motion. You know, and then you grab each other and you swing around, swing around, and you go, oh, let's make this last forever. And then you're tempted to make a permanent decision based on a temporary state of extreme urgency. And then you spend time together, spend time together. There's nobody that can make you happy. There's nobody that you can keep happy. Believe me. The way to joy is what? Be a joy bringer. Not waiting for somebody that's going to bring you to joy. Because after a while, it kind of fades away. The neurotransmitter pathways, what? Boom. What? It's like a pole vaulter. What? Boom. You know. And then, you, you, next thing you know, uh, it ain't like it was. 
You don't have the feelings. And it goes right into counseling. Right into counseling. And each one goes to counseling, trying to get the other one straightened out. Which, could you get him straightened out? Would you tell her to stop being a nag and to be that loving, beautiful thing she was when I first met her? You know. And the counselor, been to school, see, and they have learned that every relationship counseling session is really the same thing. You got two ticks and no dog. <laughs> two ticks and no dog. So it behooves us to give up this notion that somebody is just going to bring all that good stuff all the time. And they got a name for that they, that they came up with in the last 30 years. Codependent. Codependent. But I thought it was love. And you know, well, you thought it was love, but it was codependent. You know. So what do you do? How do, you, how do, we, how do we get unburdened? How do we let go? Oh, what do we have here? That's um. This is the... Yeah, subtle. This is the Christian Sandman Sims at the Apollo Theater. <laughs> you know? Guy comes out. And <laughs> drags you off. I'm, I'm, uh, I'm just about finished. Just about finished. Pardon me? Yes. Yes. Um, anyway, let me end. I can't go into the rest of the joy killers tonight. The antidote? The antidote? Understand, understand that the only lover in the universe is him. He's the only one that loves you no matter what. Unconditional love, he's the only one. There's no other lover in the universe. There is none. A girl, a woman told me one time, she goes, I told her that. And she says, no, nah, I want a real man. I said, he is the realest man. And if, that, if he is not living in a, in a man, that you're interested in, it ain't gonna work. It ain't gonna work, it's gonna be a joy killer. Let me end, I'm gonna end with a song. I'm gonna end with a song. <clears throat> and I'm gonna do it aqua propeller for you. Unless these people are real good and can just pick right up on it, but I'm not expecting that. I don't assume. You remember when you assume, your mama told you, right? <clears throat> Here's a song. That was a secular song, big hit, back in 1955 by a group called The Platters. And it was a secular hit, allegedly about some woman. And it turned out, guess what? It's a God song, and it's about the only love that exists in the universe, him. Goes like this. Do, 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 do. can make this world seem bright. <gasps> Only you can make the darkness bright. Only you and you alone can thrill me like you do and fill my heart with love for only you only you can make this change in me for it's true you are my destiny when you take my hand I understand the wonders that you do you're my dream come true my one and only you Ladies and gentlemen, Bert Rosenberg. Thank you, Bert. Thank you, thank you. Don't you just love Kareem of Wheat? That's the best line I've heard in years, Bert. I'm going to use that in my own team. 
okay, I'm sorry. Sorry. <laughs> okay. Oh, zip. It's done. Okay, I'm just the, uh, about two minutes out, I think, uh, to say thank you for uh, being here tonight at the National Conference Center and for the day. And thank a whole host of people, Bert and, 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 and Nick and the, and, and the team, the music and the guys in the booth and everybody that put this program together because from my point of view, it's been highly successful. And once you've been to the National once, you're, when you come back, you're coming back to home, okay? So I want you to remember that and two things I want you to do. The first is, is get home safely. Uh, if you're going home tonight, if you're going home tomorrow, drive safely, be with your families, and um, revive, renew, res respond. Okay? Thank you so much for a wonderful event today. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, can we give West Belmont and the National a big round of applause? And specifically, Paula, come on out here, Paula, come here. No, come here. This young lady here that put a lot of this together, give her a big hand, all right? Absolutely, yes. And, and I, I, found, I found a lot of joy in looking at these young musicians up here trying to figure out the key that Bert was actually singing in. It was difficult to find. So anyway, but I want to thank everyone for coming out and thank you for listening to WAVA as well. And we hope to do, we hope to do a lot of these in the future. And I would say that if you can uh, get on social media, Facebook, we do have uh, some postings up for this event on there. Please put your comments there. Let us know your feedback. And I believe that's something that's in the book as well in your itinerary there. So please give us the feedback. We want to make these better. And we also want to make these something that we can do on an ongoing basis. So God bless you. And I'm looking, okay, I'm going to hand it over to Paul. <laughs> yeah, I have one thing to say. So in the back of your books is a survey. That's the last page. Please pull that out, fill it out, leave it at the front desk on your way out tonight or tomorrow. Um, that'll just give us feedback to let us know how we can better serve you for our next conference. And thank you very much from the bottom of my heart to each and every one of you. Janet, uh, you especially, who from the beginning, the first concept of this, she dug her plow on the ground and she planted the seed. So thank you, thank you. All right, we're gonna hand it over. Liberty Worship Collective, thank you folks. Come on, let's all stand together and worship.
Come on, with one voice, I decide. I decided to follow Jesus. No turning back. Do you believe that? Come on. No turning back. I have decided to follow Jesus. No turning back. No turning back. Come on, the cross. The cross before me. The world behind me. No turning back. No turning back. The cross before me. The world behind me. No turning back. No
together as one church for now, but we know that we're going to be singing together again once we're in heaven, amen, right? We don't have to fear that we're not going to worship together again, but we will be together again. And so right now, let's rejoice, let's sing with our full voices and our full hearts with joy to the Lord, okay? Let's do it together. in that. Come on. Oh, may I then in him be found. We want to be dressed in his righteousness.
shout a praise together. Come on. Yeah. Oh, Jesus, we love you. We worship you, God. You are our rock and our cornerstone, our strength. God, you are the source of our joy. I pray that you keep us safe as we leave from this place, that we remain in joy, that we remain in worship to you, Lord. Thank you for this time that we've had together, Jesus. It has been so sweet. Thank you, Lord. We love you. We praise you with everything that we have in your name. Amen.